Well, good morning and thank you for joining with us and welcome to the online worship service for Lebanon Rock Church for this Sunday, September the 20th, 2020. I'm Pastor Matt Skiles and I thank you for joining with us this morning. We're so glad that you've taken the time to be a part of our online worship service. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and we're going to invite his presence in and then we'll be enjoying some time of worship together and then I'll be starting a brand new sermon series as we hear from the word of God. So join with me in prayer as we invite the presence of the Lord in to our service here this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together this morning and to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for those that have tuned in that are joining with us from wherever they are. And Father, we ask that you'll just anoint and bless the singing and preaching and ministry of your word. We pray, God, that you'll bless all those that have tuned in and are worshiping today. Lord Jesus, you said where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in the midst. We ask that you'll have your way. Lord Jesus, in this service, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to anoint everything that we say and do. And we give you thanks and praise and glory and honor. For it is in Christ's name we ask all these things. This time we're going to enter into worship and song, and then I'll be coming back momentarily with God's word and message for this week.
Praise the Lord and God be praised. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me, if you would, to Habakkuk, the third chapter, and Psalm, the 85th chapter. So if you are on your smartphone, your tablet, you have your Bible in front of you, we'll need to go to two verses of Scripture this morning. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse number 2, and Psalm chapter 85, and we're going to read uh, verses 4 through 7. And this message that we're sharing is the first of a new series that I'm doing. It's simply going to be titled Revival. The sermon series is titled Revival. And if there was ever a time that we needed revival, it's right here and right now in this day and age that we're living in. And this first message this morning is titled Preparing for Revival. So Habakkuk chapter 3, verse number 2, and Psalm chapter 85, verses 4 through 7. I'm going to be coming out of the King James Version Bible this morning, but whatever version Bible you have, whatever your Bible application you have that you're using this morning is going to be more than applicable and is going to work just fine. And we're going to share this morning in this first message how we can prepare for revival. And we need that. If you look around at everything that's happening in our nation and in our world, uh, you don't have to be a genius to figure out that we are in a very, very dark place, both spiritually and morally and as a culture and as a society. We need God to move in our midst, and we need a move of God right here and right now. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse number 2, and then we'll glance over at Psalm 85, verses 4 uh, through 7. And these uh, are words that are going to talk about revival. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 2, if you're there, you can read with me. It says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. And then, of course, flipping over to Psalm chapter 85, verses 4 through 7. And the psalmist writes these words, Turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. And again, the message this morning is preparing for revival as we're in a new sermon series simply titled Revival. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day, for your goodness and your mercy upon our lives. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to hear your word this morning. Father, we need revival, not just in the church and not just in our nation, not just in the corridors of government and power and authority and in the business world and in our secular world that's around us, but we need personal revival in our own spiritual life. Father, we pray that this message will awaken us to righteousness, will encourage us to seek you, and Lord, that we may also desire and hunger for spiritual revival and spiritual renewal. Lord, we're in a very difficult time in our history of our nation, and we're in a very difficult time in this age of the church, and we need you, God, to shine forth again and to revive us, O Lord. So bless this message, anoint the messenger, and give your word free course now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're talking for the next several weeks on the topic of revival. And revival is often a misunderstood and misused word. It's used often, but it's most of the time used in a wrong manner. Revival is more than just a series of meetings or gatherings of Christian believers. Many people have church revivals where they meet together for two or three days for a week, uh, maybe a conference over the weekend. Our churches have revival conferences, harvest revivals, spring revivals, and those are all good, but that's not really the term we need to use in this case of revival. Revival is specifically a point where the church again be, again experiences new life, much like a, a, a spring that uh, comes each season where the flowers and the uh, beautiful plants and trees begin to bloom once again. Life comes back to a tree that has been barren over the fall and over the cold winter. And much like 
Plants begin to grow and come up out of the ground. New life springs up. Revival is new life that springs up in the body of Christ. It is the body of Christ coming alive again. It has to do with bringing life back to the church. Revival is so vital that it is often spoken about, but it is rarely ever experienced, not just in the Christian believer's life, but in the body of Christ and in the church as a whole. And if you look at the modern day condition of the church, spiritually speaking, it's imperative that we experience revival. I read this from George Barna's book, The Second Coming of the Church, and this, this is what George Barna, the great pollster and, and uh, church uh, information statistician, if you will, had to say in his book. He said, the church in America is losing influence and members faster than any major institution in the nation. If a massive spiritual revival doesn't come within the next few years, America will experience total moral anarchy. And what he was saying there is, is that America is dying spiritually. And what George Barner wrote from his research and his studies and his statistics and his polling in his book here, The Second Coming of the Church, is saying that the church in America is on life support. And he notes that America loses 72 churches each week. That means 72 churches in America close their doors never to open again. That averages out to 10 churches a day. And it only gains 24 new churches weekly. Or three and a half new churches a birth per day. So we are on the losing end of this spiritual battle. And what he is saying is the church has to have a spiritual breakthrough, a time of spiritual revival and renewal. Uh, Walter Boat is quoted as saying, Revival is God at work, restoring his church to health. This is an acceptable definition if we understand that a healthy church is an evangelistic church, is a New Testament church, is a soul winning church is a praying church, is a spirit-filled church, is a church that is doing the work that God has called us to do. When Jesus gave us the words of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, and also the words he said very similarly in Mark chapter 16. The church can experience revival, but revival can be the experience of the whole body of Christ, a local church, or simply one individual Christian person. And Billy Sunday, the great evangelist of the 20th century, the early 20th century, said, they tell me a revival is temporary. He said, so is bathing, but it does you good when you experience it. And revival is not something that comes just once in our lifetime. Revival is not something we experience periodically. It should be something that we should be hungering and desiring for every single spirit. A day of our spiritual life. We should be longing for that. The church is, is dying. The church is dry. The church is barren. The church is lifeless. When you see a church that is more interested in entertaining people, more interested in telling people what they want to hear, not what they need to hear, has no care or concern for the moral decay of society, has no care or concern for a generation of young people and a generation of kids and teenagers and young adults that are, that are becoming indifferent to church and complacent and falling away from the faith and turning their backs on the church and Jesus Christ. You know we need revival. America, whether anybody wants to accept this truth or not, was founded on Christian principles and was founded as a Christian nation. Our motto is one nation under God. It's on our currency. And the Ten Commandments are posted in the Supreme Court of the United States. We were founded on basic biblical Christian principles. Now secular society and, and humanistic thinking and many, many different parts and elements of the world system have tried to break down uh, the wonderful foundation that we have in this nation, but it is up to us as Christian believers to once again pray and seek out the Lord for revival. I need revival in my life. You need revival in your life. And it only happens whenever we truly desire and seek God 
for his presence, his power, his glory, and his blessing. The late Dr. A.T. Pearson, great, great Presbyterian theologian, once said, there has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. Let me recount what God has done through concerted, united, sustained prayer. And he began to share all the miracles and great works that God did, not in, only in the word of God, but in the church and the body of Christ as a whole. So I want us to look at three things this morning as we talk about preparing for revival, because revival just doesn't happen. You have to prepare for it, and you have to prepare your heart. You have to prepare your mind. You have to prepare yourself to receive what God wants to do. And I assure you that if God's people, if the children of God, the body of Christ, the church will begin to seek after and pray and hunger for the things of God and for God to restore spiritually what the enemy has destroyed, we will begin to see new life come into the church and we will experience revival. You know, my son-in-law is a, is a lineman and he often goes down and has to do uh, work whenever there's a storm, whether it be a hurricane or tornadoes or a windstorm. He often has gone to many different places in the United States. I'm very proud of my son-in-law. He's a hardworking young man. He's in a very dangerous job as a lineman. And when he goes to these places, whether it's on the East Coast or in the Southeast, he's always having to go and repair the damage that has been done. And it amazes me how when a hurricane or a storm comes through a particular region and that region is destroyed and that region is devastated, a few years later after the rebuilding has taken place and the renewing of all that property and the rebuilding has taken place, it's built back and those communities that were once destroyed are now once again restored and renewed and are very beautiful and, and homes have been replaced and, and, and lives have been restored and, and people seem to get their life back in, in, in place again. That's what revival is. Revival is restoring what the enemy has destroyed. Revival is rebuilding what has been torn down. Revival is God breathing life into the church and the church experiencing new life, spiritual growth, and, and, and blessings, and miracles. The church talks about a faith that it doesn't really have. We talk about miracles that we don't experience. We talk about a, a gospel that we don't preach or share, and we wonder why the church is dying on the vine. I can tell you why, because we have not experienced a true spiritual revival that the church needs here in 2020. So our first point this morning as we get into this message, as we unpack this message this morning, as I hope this will get into your spirit as we allow God's word to speak to us, point number one is it is right to pray for revival. We talk about preparing for revival. It all starts with prayer. So it is right to pray for revival. Go back and look at our keynote there in Psalm chapter 85 and verse 6. The psalmist asks the question, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? He asked the question, will you not revive us again, O Lord? He's praying for revival. And I submit to you that all revivals, from the beginning of the early church at, at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 up to the current day, any time there has been a spiritual revival and a spiritual breakthrough in a church, in a community, in a region, in any part of the world, it has began in prayer. The great D.L. Moody once said, every great work of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. There is, I believe, no greater issue facing the church at this time than the subject of a great need for spiritual revival. There's no greater passage in the Word of God that shows the way to true spiritual revival than the words in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, where it reads, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If that doesn't speak to your heart this morning, then I don't know what does, because if there was ever a time that America needed healing in our land, it's right now. 
And it happens when God's people, God's people, he says the people which are called by my name, when God's people begin to turn to God in prayer, repent and confess their sin and call on the Lord, that's when we start to see true spiritual revival and God's presence and healing in our land. And so what are we doing as we prepare for revival? We should be praying because it is right to pray for revival. John Wesley said, God does nothing but an answer to prayer. We must be praying. The Bible makes it very clear that we should be doing this practice of prayer in our lives, seeking the Lord. In 1 Chronicles 16 and 11, it reads, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face continually. Psalm chapter 55 and verse 1, the psalmist says, give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my supplication. And in Psalm 55 and verse 17, the psalmist says, Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Revival is birthed in prayer. Revival brings prayer. Revival is, 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 the, is the fallout of God's people beginning to seek God in prayer. And it's not just a simple prayer. It is a true desire to see God move in our life. That's why the psalmist speaks there in Psalm 55 and 17 when he says in the evening, in the morning, and at noon, he says all hours of the day will I have a mindset and a focus on prayer. We should set aside time every day and pray for the needs that we have in our life, to pray for our family, our loved ones, our own personal needs and supplications, but we need to be praying for God's people, praying for the church, praying for revival, praying for God to intercede on our behalf, move in our nation, move in our lands. When's the last time we prayed for our young people on the school and college campuses? When's the last time we prayed for our political leaders? When's the last time we spent time praying for the moral decay and the moral problems in our nation. We have a problem with sin in the United States and our country is falling by the wayside. We need to be praying now more than ever. And I encourage you to take time and to understand that prayer is what brings about the presence of God. Remember Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 these words he said and when you pray he didn't say if you pray or should you pray but Jesus said and when you pray. What the Lord was saying there was he expected us to be people of prayer. And that's why in Matthew 26 and verse 41, Jesus said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. A lot of times we don't feel like praying. A lot of times we don't have the desire or the time or the strength or the energy to pray. It alarms me that people will spend hours and hours and hours in front of a television or in front of their computer, or scanning their tablet or their smartphones and, and watching what's happening on YouTube or on uh, social media or on some other social platform. And don't get me wrong, social media is an effective way to help share the gospel, to help reach out to people, to help uh, have interaction with other people. But when it becomes our life and we spend more time on Facebook or on Instagram or on Twitter, or on some other social platform, instead of spending time talking to God in prayer, we have lost our spiritual edge and we've lost our faith and we need to dust off that wonderful principle and go back to praying and seeking God like we used to. Second point we want to take and gather from this message this morning is it is right to expect God to move in revival. Now in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 2, the prophet Habakkuk is praying and says, O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. In wrath, remember mercy. And again, in Psalm 85 and 6, the psalmist said, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? You know, He's asking the question, wilt thou not revive us again? 
And you know what? There are Christian people that I, I've known all my life. And they truly believe that God can send revival. They've even shared with me about revivals that they've experienced in their own life, in the past, in years gone by. The Word of God gives us examples of the early church and how they were on fire for God and what great power and authority that they were able to minister and preach the Word of God in. But we also have memories of history to tell us of the great revivals that were that were there. You know, we read about Charles Wesley and John Wesley who brought revival to England. And we, we read and I've read about Jonathan Edwards who brought revival to colonial America. Uh, Charles Finney brought revival, a great revival in 1857. And of course we read about the Welsh revival. We read about the Azusa Street outpouring at the dawn of the 20th century in Los Angeles, California. And we've often heard about all the great, great uh, uh, historical moves of God that have taken place. We've seen a whole generation impacted by the ministry of Billy Graham and hundreds of thousands of people that uh, no doubt millions of people now by this point that have come to Jesus Christ because of Reverend Billy Graham and we know of the history of revival, but there's always voices of the defeatists. There's always people that doubt we can have a present and an earnest move of the Holy Spirit and a revival from heaven now. But you see, that's the way it is. That's the kind of culture that we're living in right now. Uh, we live in a time of great idolatry. We live in a time of great humanistic thinking. We live in a secular world that is trying to push God out of the public arena, push God out of the public conscience, trying to marginalize Christians and pigeonhole Christians. But I submit to you that Jesus Christ said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And Jesus said that he would build his church upon this rock and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And so as Christian believers and as individual believers, as members of the body of Christ, as a pastor of a local church, I can share with you honestly that this pandemic we've been through the last six months has had a, a, a devastating effect on the body of Christ. Yes, people have, have, have still connected and still had time to worship and join together in prayer and still be a part of of worship on Sunday and a part of the body of Christ, but we have seen efforts by some in authority, some in power. We've seen actions taken by government officials to try to keep people from worshiping in the house of God, entering into the church, spending time in prayer, spending time in worship. And when you start to see these things happen, you know that it is the world system and our, our secular society and our current culture that is, that is trying to stifle what God is wanting to do, but we need to be praying, and it is right to expect God to move in revival. Elijah faced that in the Old Testament. The prophet Elijah encountered the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, and by this time, the children of Israel were, were giving in to idolatry. They were rebelling against God. And you can see almost a mirror image of the culture of the United States and the culture of Elijah's day. And one man, the prophet Elijah, stood upon the Mount Carmel and he said to the prophets of Baal, let's set up a sacrifice. And you put an animal in sacrifice to your God and I'll put a sacrifice and offer a sacrifice to my God. And the God that answers by fire, let him be the God that... Uh, let him be the God that you serve. And of course, the prophets of Baal, there were 400 of them. They put the, uh, they put the uh, uh, animal and the sacrifice on the altar. And uh, I want you, if you can, to go to 1 Kings chapter 18. This is a great story. And this shows us what revival will do when God truly answers prayer and when God begins to move. I've got a lot of scripture here, so bear with me. 1 Kings chapter 18. And I'm going to read verses 29 all the way down to verse 43. And again, I laid the foundation and kind of gave you a little background here. You have the prophet Elijah on one side and the prophets of Baal, false prophets, 400 of them, on the other side. 
And they have a sacrifice on the altar. And they're wailing and crying out to their idol and their god, Baal. And Elisha is all by himself. 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning at verse number 29. That's where we pick it up. All the way down to verse 43. If you can't find it in your Bibles, just listen to these words. It reads, And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces. That's the animal for the sacrifice. And laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran around about the altar and it filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let none of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, cast himself down upon the earth, put his face between his knees, he's in a position of praying, and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again, arise seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time, and he said, Behold, there. Arise, a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Now there was a drought in the land. And they were praying and calling on God to see who would answer. And in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 29 to 43, Elijah stood up against the prophets of Baal. Stood up against the worldly system of that day. And he called out to God. He rebuilt the altar. In other words, he restored prayer. And then after he had prayed, he waited and expected on God to answer. And God answered. I submit to you that if we are praying for revival, we need to expect God to move on our behalf. We need to expect God to bless us and send a revival from the north to the south to the east and to the west. Let it start in our own life. Let it start in our own local church. Let it then move to the body of Christ and let it permeate throughout our nation and around the world. If we do that, we will see God do great things in these last days in which we live. And the third and final point that we need to unpack from this message this morning, it is right to expect rejoicing to result from revival. One thing that revival will do is it will bring joy to the body of Christ. The psalmist prayed these words in Psalm 51, verses 7 through 12. He says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. 
Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Revival may bring tears of confession and tears of repentance and tears of prayer, but it proceeds to joy. The Christian who is continually grieving and worried about their past sins does not understand the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and truly needs revival. Revival and rejoicing go hand in hand. You know, whenever there's revival, it will change the culture. It will impact a community. It will bring about a sense of conviction and an awareness of what is right and what is wrong. If we ever need a revival in the United States of America, it is right now. We see the sin and wickedness and evil that is running rampant in our nation. We see the civil unrest that is taking place, the social disorder that is taking place. We see how evil and wicked our world is. Is it any wonder that when in a violent and evil time such as now, that the enemy is, is, is running rampant through our culture and through our world? It is time that the body of Christ, the church of the living God, the, the, the Christian believer, you and I, is who I'm talking about here. It is time we begin to seek God. It's, 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 it's right to pray for revival. It's right to expect uh, God to, to move in revival. And it is also right to experience joy and rejoicing as a result of revival. I want to see God move in Lebanon Rock Church. I want to see God move in your life, in your family's life. I want to see God move in our nation. I want to see a time where, where we no longer hear about murder, rape, no longer see the, the sin and the iniquity that is everywhere, from the halls of government to the entertainment world to the media, on, 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 on the campuses of our schools, in our neighborhoods. What kind of a world and what kind of a nation and what kind of a culture have we become whenever we see a state like California just this week pass a law that reduces the sentence of people that commit pedophilia? Folks, when something like that begins to happen and is enacted as a law in the United States of America, we need to be praying for revival. When innocent children, when families are hurt, when people are hurt and treated unfairly, when there's violence and chaos, and there is no peace, there's nothing but unrest and uneasiness, then we need to pray. Not just for our, our nation, not just for our upcoming elections, not just for uh, the future of our, of our country, but we need to pray for ourselves. We need to be closer to God. We need to be experiencing revival, and we need to be experiencing a move of the Holy Spirit. If we, if we experience that and we see revival in our own life, it'll transcend and transform our life. It'll impact our family. It'll reach out and touch our co-workers, our neighbors, our friends. It'll make a dent against the evil in our world and it will begin to turn the tide and bring about righteousness, peace, joy and it'll also bring about the presence of God in our nation and a restoration that we so desperately need so as I close this morning are you willing to let revival begin in you are you willing to pray are you willing to have the faith to expect God to move and are you ready for God to restore unto you the joy of your salvation I want that in my mind I've watched enough news in the last several weeks that it has depressed me and discouraged me to the point where I've just simply turned off the news. And I, I simply don't want to hear any more negativity. And I've decided in my own heart and in my own life, I'm going to pray and fast and seek the Lord in prayer. And 
And I want God to move not just in my local church that I'm, I'm privileged to be a pastor of, but in my community, in my family, in my nation, in my world. I want that and I know you do too. So as you go into this next week of your life, pray and ask the Lord to begin to work in your life. Draw closer to God. Ask him to begin to revive your heart, revive your spirit. And in the next few weeks, I'll be sharing more messages on revival and why we need revival. So as we close in prayer, let that be our prayer this week, that God will revive us and revive us spiritually. And let revival start with you and let it start with you. Let us close in prayer this week. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message as we've heard today. We thank you for the word of God that has been shared. Lord, these are very difficult and trying times, not only for Christian believers, but for the church and the body of Christ. Lord, we are living in evil days and difficult times. Social unrest, civil disorder, violence, anger, bitterness, fighting. Lord, we've, we've seen so much dissension and discord and division. And Lord, we need restoration and reconciliation in our nation. And that only comes through revival and spiritual renewal. Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus this morning that you will send revival. Let it start in our own heart, in our own life. Father God, I pray that you'll revive my heart. As the psalmist prayed in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart. Renew in me a right spirit. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me and restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Lord, for every man, woman, boy and girl that's listening to this broadcast, that's a part of this online worship service, I pray this week that the Holy Spirit will just fill their hearts afresh. He'll touch their minds and their heart with a fresh touch of your Holy Spirit, a fresh baptism of your love, and a fresh outpouring of your grace, which is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you'll send revival to our families, to our marriages, to our communities, to our nation, to our government, to those in authority and leadership on the school campuses and on the college and university campuses, in neighborhoods, big cities and small towns. Lord, send revival. Let churches begin to once again turn to, their, turn to the altar and seek your face. Lord, we turn from our evil and our wicked ways and we repent of our sins and we confess our faults and sins to you and ask you, God, to cleanse us by the blood of Jesus. Wash us in your blood, Lord Jesus, and let us walk in newness of life. Let us experience an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Let us see revival that will see souls saved, that will see families and marriages restored, that will see communities transformed, and we'll see healing and restoration and reconciliation come to our nation. Now bless us, Lord, with a good week of victory and a good week of blessing. And be with us, Lord, and bring us back at the appointed time as you dismiss us from this place but not your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us this morning. Have a wonderful week, and God bless you. We'll see you all next time as we gather together to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. God bless you until next time.